I'm joined by Kate Lunau, Canadian editor of Motherboard, and Kavukian, founder of Privacy by Design, and Daniel Bader, managing editor of Mobile Nations. They're all with me in Toronto tonight. So here's the thing. Facial recognition on this new iPhone, Galaxy 8 has it as well. You know, they told us that fingerprint was the best. Now they're saying facial recognition is the most secure. Is this a step forward or back, Anne? It's a step forward in terms of replacing pins and other identifiers. It's a very strong biometric, especially the way that Apple has configured it. Um, it is very uh, securely hashed, which is a mathematical algorithm that makes it very difficult to actually detect the biometric. The main problem that I've heard about with the facial recognition on the Apple is the fear that the bad guys or, you know, the police or border crossing people will go like this and just put the device to your face and get you to turn on the device that way, which could be an enormous problem. Indeed. Kate, how worried should we be about privacy with these new iterations of smartphones? It's a huge question, and it's definitely a really important one. As Anne said, when these devices were being announced, people were wondering if I'm asleep, can someone open my phone? Now, Apple says that you need to be attentive for the Face ID to work, which I think means you need to be looking at the screen. But still, we're going to be living in a world where our face becomes identification. Now, my face, as many other people's, is on the Internet. It's in photos everywhere. It's really a public presentation of myself to the world, unlike, say, a fingerprint or a pin. So that's something we're, going to, we're really going to need to consider going forward. Daniel, let's take a step back for a moment. Some people were surprised to learn that it's been 10 years since the iPhone emerged and changed many people's lives. What's happened to our psychology about connectivity with this iPhone and, and other smartphones? Right. So I think the iPhone and other smartphones have bridged the, the, the travel gap with, with millions of people. If you have somebody across the world you want to talk to, you can do it instantaneously from anywhere. But the concern psychologically is that it's actually stopped many people from communicating in person. It's, it's limited the time that people spend talking on the phone. And instead, we now text. We now use iMessage. And these are apps that, while incredibly um, powerful and allow us to express ourselves in many ways, are inherently limited. And there have been numerous studies showing that people are not quite as attentive to one another when they're in the same space because they have their phones on them at all times. Now, is that something widely believed, or is this something like worried parents like me about my kid never talks to me eye to eye? <laughs> well, I think that there have, there, there have been actual studies to show that attention deficit is a growing problem among young people and among adults as well. And I think that the, the main thing here is that we just have to be cognizant of our attention. We think that we can multitask really well, but when we have our phone in our hand, it's really difficult to do so properly. Kate, what do you think? Are there areas that we should be worried about and working and sort of, you know, stepping up against uh, less connectivity with, with smartphones? I don't know that I would advocate for less connectivity. I value my connectivity highly. I think that sometimes we don't appreciate enough how amazing it is that we walk around the world with a very powerful computer in our pocket. That being said, there are issues. I mean, we are reachable anywhere that we go. There was a really interesting moment in the Apple keynote last week when they were unveiling these products, and they used an Apple Watch to phone someone on a paddleboard. I mean, if people are going to be calling me when I'm on a paddleboard for meetings, like, I'm not going to be very excited about that. But that's the world we live in now. That's what we can do, for better or for worse. And, Anne, what about our notion of privacy? Are we too complacent? Well, the whole issue with the smartphones and the connected devices is it ushered in an era of surveillance because no longer is your smartphone just a phone that you call people with. Once someone has access to your smartphone, it opens the door, it is the gateway to all of your personal information in terms of potentially your financial records, your banking information, your personal health records, your medical data, where you go during the day and to whom uh, you converse, and all of these connections, this whole new era of information, personally identifiable data, very sensitive, is now potentially accessible to anyone who can access your smartphone. So it's not just a phone, obviously. It is a device that could potentially engage in massive surveillance, and that's, in fact, what we're, what we're seeing these days. It's curious now, you know, we've lived 10 years with um, 
the new smartphones and what they're able to do, and they get enhanced every year, it seems now. But Daniel, are we coming to a point where there's going to be another big leap in technology uh, to do with smartphones? Yeah, so the, the smartphone as a, as a device, as a product, has, has largely matured to the point where there probably won't be major design leaps going forward. I think the main thing is that it's now a consolidator for so many other things in our lives. There's no longer a need for a separate camera, for instance. Um, the cameras on our phones are fantastic. And I think the next big thing is augmented reality and virtual reality. These are products that have uh, proliferated over the past couple of years by the attention that they've received from, from Apple and from Google, respectively. AR especially has been given a ton of of press in the last couple of months over Apple's new AR kit feature, which allows you to literally augment the the, the camera, the, what your camera sees in front of it with digital information overlays. And it's quite something to see in real life. Tim Cook, I was reading something he said about augmented reality uh, recently, and he says it's as big an idea as the smartphone was back 10 years ago. I mean, they're really looking at augmented reality as the next big deal. Um, how fast and how much will it change things, Kate? It really positions our phone as this mediator. I mean, it already is one, but between us and the environment that we're in, you know, there are examples of apps that are out now and more that are coming where you're looking at your phone and you can see the stars in the sky, they're really there and it can tell you, you know, what constellations are there. You're watching a sports game and you shine your phone at one of the players and you get all the stats. So it really, again, it just, it positions our phone as this thing that augments and accentuates the environment around us, which is pretty amazing. Can you just explain, help me out with that, AR versus VR? So VR, virtual reality, is sort of you immersed in a 360 virtual environment. Augmented reality is more something like, if people remember Pokemon Go last year, <laughs> right? You're looking on your screen and you can see, I could see Pokemons in the newsroom if I were playing this right now, but I'm still, you know, I'm here. I'm seeing it on my screen. Okay, and you, I saw you wanted to jump in there. Well, I wanna, I wanna bring people back to the reality of the smartphones and the connected devices that are increasing with the Internet of Things that are happening right now. And the fears associated with that in terms of the massive potential for um, what I call unex unintended consequences. All of these devices are intended to help and do what we want them to do, but in the wrong hands, the potential for surveillance and others getting access to your information is enormous. So what we need to develop is we need to embed privacy and security into the design of all of, the, all of these new technologies and these new devices so that the individual can exert greater control over the uses of his or her personal information. And that's, that's going to take be advocacy, critical. isn't it? Advocacy like never before. I've started a new international council called the Global Council for um, Global Privacy and Security by Design precisely because we have to globally get interest on how to embed privacy and security into these devices and return control to the individual. That's where it belongs. Daniel, a minute left or so. Are we headed into a brave new world that's uh, uh, good, progressive and exciting, <laughs> or should we be worried about some of this? We should absolutely be worried, but it, it is incredibly exciting. There is nuance to everything we're talking about here. I think Anne is absolutely right. People have to advocate for their own privacy, but the first thing people have to do is realize that security on their device is, is important and is, uh, is possible through things like biometrics, like fingerprint and yes. facial recognition, and through two-factor authentication, which is something that is completely underutilized in our society, and, th and, and we have to take responsibility for that. Um, but it also, you know, phones are the vector to everything else, and as a result, they could be the single point of failure, but they are also the most exciting breakthrough in technology in, in recent modern history. Well, it's become our everyone, everything for, for many of us. Thanks so much for wading through some of this, all three of you tonight.